All right. And it says recording. And it says recording. <laughs> Greetings, everyone, and uh, uh, welcome to the CSI Next uh, November Chapter Meeting. Apologize for the delay. Uh, just got to love technology. Uh, we had some hurdles to get over, but we got everything running. And uh, so um, uh, I'm Daniel Hargreaves. Hopefully, uh, by now you all know who I am, but I am the electronics chair and treasurer for the chapter. Uh, before we begin the presentation, I do want to uh, uh, open it up with a little bit of chapter business. Uh, this one's going to go really quick. Um, so mark your calendars for December 5th. That's our next chapter meeting. Casey Robb, uh, former institute president, has a presentation that he's going to do live. and. Uh, uh, he's still working out the details, and when we get those, we'll let everyone know. As soon as that's available, registration like these will be available at csinext.org. If you're not a CSI Next uh, chapter member, boy, we sure would like to have you join us. Uh, the chapter's strong and growing right now. We're at 70 members, and it seems like each month we keep creeping up, so that's kind of exciting. Besides the occasional meeting notification, uh, you'll get the monthly newsletter, e-blast, program information, opportunities to even create your own blog if you've ever seen the artichoke life that I try to write weekly, um, chapter events and more, and ju just the proud honor of wearing the CSI Next badge. With that, um, let's begin our presentation, Changing the Language of Concrete, presented by Chris Bennett and Keith Robinson. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand, type them in. Uh, um, if we see your hand go up, uh, we'll uh, activate your uh, webcam. Uh, we're still learning this new uh, Zoom presentation. And uh, at the end of this, there will be a uh, survey to uh, fill out and uh, to get your AI credit or CEU, uh, be sure to fill out that survey and I will be sending out the uh, certifications and this is registered for one learning unit with the AIA. So uh, those that are members of AI, please include your AI number in that. And with that, I'd like to introduce our two speakers, Chris Bennett and Keith Robinson. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us. Um, yeah, for those of you that might not know me, uh, I'm a uh, concrete consultant. I live out of Portland, Oregon, and I guess not totally new member of CSI Next, but relatively new, um, and uh, very grateful for this opportunity. Uh, Keith, do you want to introduce yourself a bit? Sure. I'm a specifications writer. I've been a member of CSI Next, I think, for almost 10 years, and yeah, a, a bit of a concrete nut. So it's the, the need to change the language of concrete. <laughs> yeah, and we uh, originally gave this uh, presentation uh, with John Gwill and Bill Dubois uh, in Long Beach last year at Construct, uh, which is why you see some of the uh, familiar branding uh, from the national event, uh, but uh, we were asked specifically uh, if we could kind of re reprise this, and so uh, that's what we're going to do today. Unfortunately, uh, without the help of uh, John uh, and and Bill, but we'll 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 try to we'll try to make do with our our meager our meager uh, skills here. <laughs> uh, and with that, start into it. Uh, now why? Hmm. Now this might be the only slide we see, ladies and gentlemen. My arrow isn't clicking it forward. Why would that be? Oh, there we go. Fantastic. Whatever it was, it's over. Um, uh, the, the long and, and short of it is that uh, there are Concrete, especially within the last 10, 15 years, uh, the technologies behind it have changed uh, at an alarming rate. Uh, 
not in a bad way, lots of advancements, but to remain, to remain uh, competent uh, of new technologies and methodologies, it can be kind of hard. Um, and so for many, many reasons, uh, what kind of happens is you get a lot of, of reproducing past work. Um, and fundamentally, there hasn't been a lot of changes. Uh, on my side of the house, I deal with a lot of flat work concrete. Most of your cast in place specifications are still based off of, you know, a 50 year old uh, ACI 302 document. Um, it's not a bad document. There's a reason why it works. Um, but that doesn't mean uh, there isn't room for significant uh, improvement in sustainability and cost and schedule considerations. Um, and so we're going to talk about that some of uh, today and, and how that language is, is key to unlocking uh, being able to have these advancements. Yeah, and it's fair to say, Chris, that we found that uh, uh, people use concrete terms and concrete languages interchangeably, sealers and coatings and densifiers and you know, uh, hardeners, the, the, the problem is, is the language of concrete isn't well set. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, and as, uh, as John Will absolutely says many, many times, words mean something. And if you don't have a, a set definition that uh, designers and constructors and everybody have agreed that, okay, this is what it means. And when we present it to the estimator, they know what the heck we're talking about. Um, you can really clearly have well-intended, you know, well-meaning intended people kind of start going uh, north and south. Um, let's see here. And Keith, just jump in at any time. Sure. Uh, uh, maybe wait for the airplane drone there. Uh, one of the one of the first things that uh, I've always uh, thought is interesting is despite the overwhelming la uh, overwhelming physical evidence of gosh not just Roman concrete uh, but people in Africa and Asia using uh, you know thousands of years ago essentially waterproof mortars uh, there's this kind of thought process that concrete it just inherently has to be kind of brittle it isn't going to last very long you've got to bubble wrap it in all sorts of you know moisture mitigating products uh, because it's just inherently bad and uh, of course uh, history uh, and this is you know uh, a little dramatization here taking the worst uh, case scenario uh, to, to prove a point uh, in, in modern times, uh, you'll see a lot of structures that are well under 100 years old, some of them 50, 40, that are absolutely falling apart. Uh, in Canada, in the United States, it's well over 10,000 something bridges uh, that need to be repaired. Um, and generally speaking, they're, they're fairly new. And so why is it that uh, the Romans could build these structures that are still load bearing, still uh, in use and have spent, you know, in some cases the last 23, 2400 years under salt water. Uh, you know, what did they know that we, we didn't know? Um, and it's to just kind of alert people or remind people that um, it, it is possible to build better concrete. It's, it's not um, uh, something magical that you're chasing. Uh, it does exist. Um, and as sort of a, a broader generalization, um, and I only stand by this 60% of the time, <laughs> uh, the, the concentration was, th was three-tiered, uh, durability, utility, and then beauty. And I would argue that a lot of times uh, in North America, we will sacrifice uh, certainly durability, a little bit of utility to just get the aesthetics right uh, without maybe as much thought as we should for the longevity uh, of the product. And so- yeah, and these terms were invented by Vitruvius if people didn't know that he was the original spec writer uh, from 50 BCE and his specs were so well developed, you can tell he must have copied them from somebody else at the time as well. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, as 
and all of us are sort of, uh, of linguists, right, uh, of a certain variety uh, because of the nature of how we, we deal with words, uh, uh, with specifications. But that's something that uh, is also to be expected, right? If they're building things to last, they had the vocabulary and the definition to do so. Um, and as, as Bill Dubois would point out, you know, uh, sometimes the language for concrete gets a little loosey-goosey and becomes completely subjective. And so, uh, and what did John Bull say? So sometimes you just find a quiet place in the forest and you stare off into the trees <laughs> and hope that it's over soon. Because um, uh, it can be frustrating when you can't get people to agree on which direction we're heading. So uh, with that, uh, the next section here, it is about new technologies, but I would say uh, fundamentally, it's, a, it's been about exploring the language as well, understanding what, uh, what is capable uh, with fully cured concrete, um, and then how to have a lexicon for that so it can be understood at very, very basic levels by everybody in the project team. Um, and, and Keith and I have both been on this road actually for, I don't know, 2013, 14, something like that. Um, a few years, yeah. Uh, yeah, at uh, different universities, World of Concrete, uh, CSI, CSC, uh, regional chapter events, uh, training not only uh, architects, uh, uh, but making sure that we're having an open dialogue with academia, with contractors, and doing a lot of contractor training so that... Uh, a lot of those discussions of, you know, why do you do these things? Why are you specifying it that way? You can have a lot of those uh, conversations that you don't have time for under the pressure of project conditions to really flush out what people mean. Um, and uh, it's a lot has, has progressed in that four or five years. Um, and I've been able to implement it into my practice. I know Keith and many, many others have as well. Uh, and this is uh, this, this last one was at University uh, of Alberta, and we poured uh, this slab and uh, just to, I guess, kind of prove prove the point. We took what we had been doing out in the field on real projects and demonstrated it uh, at the engineering uh, school there at University of Alberta, and we poured that slab. and And Keith, do you want to tell people when we started putting uh, commercial grade grinders on that to install floors? Oh, yeah. No, it was, um, uh, it was done as a specific introduction to architectural flat concrete at Edmonton. And uh, so the concrete, was, as Chris said, was placed in the morning. There was some uh, 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 finishing um, uh, additives put onto the surface of the concrete. The concrete was ready to, to work on in the afternoon. Um, so yeah, so uh, the, the grinder went on, uh, the, the couple of the people, you can see some of the uh, people standing around, uh, they're the students at the university, and they all had a chance to work on, on the slab and actually, you know, uh, one, screed it off, make it level, and at the same time also uh, after everything, after the concrete had been set, they were actually grinding the concrete and uh, starting to polish it up, so. Yeah, and it's... And I would say uh, there is, and there's some reasons for it, uh, uh, depending on the application, but I would say overall there has been, um, and, and maybe Keith, you can think of a better way to say it, but it's a, a lot of the marketing material that I will get, uh, or a lot of the messaging is this foregone conclusion that concrete's just naturally going to be bad. Um, yeah, and, and in fact, in this particular slide, right, water is not the problem. You know, everybody's waiting for the set water to come up onto the surface before they put their floats on. They're, they're waiting for all sorts of, uh, you know, old school, um, uh, you know, wet finger in the wind kind of like, this is the way we're going to do it. But in fact, what we, what we did here was we actually kept the water in the slab so that you didn't build up micro channels and other things which tend to make concrete go bad in the future, actually decreases the durability of the concrete. Um, 
And in, in fact, it also allowed the, uh, the floats to actually go over the concrete three times to actually make have a much more planar floor. Um, and again, like by using finishing aids on the slab, that, that just made the concrete more workable for a longer period of time. Um, I, it tends to make concrete finishers nervous because all of the things that they talk about, you know, with fly ashing concrete and it delays the set and everything else, you kind of have to go up to one side and say, look at really, when you put stuff on the slab, you actually make the slab better. It becomes more durable, which when, when you consider the sustainable aspects of concrete are absolutely essential um, because you, you, the carbon load alone on, on producing atomic cement uh, that goes into the concrete, we can't afford to be throwing that away every 50 or 60 years. Yeah. So that's what this is really comes down to. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, um, and just a, a quick comment uh, to dovetail off of a couple of the points you made. It's because uh, I know relative humidity, specifically uh, when it comes to certain warranties, uh, will become a big issue. Um, and I, I understand why it could be a problem if that moisture is leaving the slab. If it's not, it really doesn't, I mean, it could be, you know, uh, an ocean of <laughs> purely liquid water, you know, theoretically speaking. Um, but if it's not leaving the matrix of the slab, you don't have a problem. And so relative humidity for concrete, it, it, it can be an issue, but again, only if, only if it's leaving. And so a lot of the new uh, admixtures and finishing aids uh, that are available, you're able to hold that placement water in which uh, does make finishing easier, uh, as Keith mentioned. Um, and it also cuts down on uh, the, the need, the chance for some of the guys, you know, at the truck to bring out the hose. Hose and start watering things down, yeah. Water of convenience, which totally, you know, long-term, it gets the job done, right? Um, but the, the long-term durability, that resilience, it's out the window when all of a sudden you start losing P measurable PSI. Um, and I guess we kind of talked about that there, no need to, uh, 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 that water loss just uh, basically saying here on this slide is uh, not being able to properly control uh, that moisture uh, leads to so many of the problems, uh, not only structurally, but aesthetically, certainly uh, with uh, a lot of the polished concrete that I do, you know, people are like, why do, why do I have crazing? Why is the aggregate exposure different here? Um, and it's moisture uh, and not controlling it correctly is, is a big part of that. Um, so going back again into kind of Roman times, uh, it was well documented that uh, you could have moisture, right? It's one of the, you've got four components to concrete. You've got water, sand, aggregate, and then you've got the cement. And what you want to happen in the hydration uh, cycle of, of concrete is when that moisture comes in contact with the cement grain to create, uh, for Portland cement, calcium silicate hydrate. For some of the Roman maritime concrete, uh, uh, different varieties of altobomorite. Um, but uh, Pliny the Elder describes the process of when that moisture comes in contact, say in an ocean, the concrete actually reacts by creating, physically creating more crystal, which goes into the capillaries and makes the concrete more dense and stronger. And uh, Keith and I are uh, fortunate to know a fantastic uh, uh, woman, uh, very, very smart, usually the smartest person in the room. And she, <laughs> Ray Taylor, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Ray Taylor. Uh, and she's funny too, uh, uh, in, in addition to being smart. Uh, and she worked on the team uh, with uh, UC Berkeley and uh, King Abdullah University uh, and some other groups in taking the core samples and being able to articulate why uh, this Roman maritime concrete without uh, the advent at the time, obviously, of curing compounds and vapor barriers and all these things, how you're able to have concrete last in, I mean, truly, uh, for all intents and purposes, caustic situations in a marine environment. 
lots of corrosion. And, uh, and what's been really amazing, uh, kind of maybe not because, simply because of that study, but it all sort of happening around the same time, is you have seen um, uh, manufacturers, designers researching, kind of revisiting this. Well, what, what if we can go back to Roman concrete a bit or s borrow some of those properties and themes? And so uh, just a, a quick overview, you've got uh, your self-healing uh, concrete and some of it is, uh, there's what, like three, two or three different kinds. Some of it's bacteria, uh, but uh, essentially when it comes into contact with uh, moisture or corrosive elements, instead of falling apart or needing some sort of, you know, petrochemical band-aid to keep it together just a couple more, a uh, couple more years, uh, the concrete starts to, uh, to heal itself either through more crystal growth um, or removing uh, the elements uh, at, uh, Camp, the National Center for Education Research on Corrosion and Materials Performance, uh, where uh, the next symposium will be uh, in April. Uh, there's a gentleman, Dr. David Bastidas, who has developed corrosion inhibitors that, again, uh, when the corrosive elements are detected chemically uh, in the concrete, primarily from rebar, uh, and concrete uh, interaction, uh, uh, the uh, inhibitors are released to slow that down. And what he's been able to do is instead of using some of the more caustic um, uh, metal-based chemicals that uh, traditionally encapsulate these inhibitors, is he's using uh, resin from California pines, uh, which is a very renewable source. Uh, but the, uh, they release it about the same time. Uh, and again, uh, directly relate with, uh, deal with the issue of those corrosive elements and that moisture coming in and, and trying to not just put a Band-Aid on the problem, but deal with it. Um, I would say fundamentally, uh, and there's a lot of, of different types of these out in the market, uh, but the... Uh, as far as market uh, adapting uh, to change and incorporating it, it would be any of your, your hydro, hydro cements, your hydrating cements, which help retain that placement water. Um, and I've got uh, uh, so the, the, I, I, the major difference is, is instead of trying to get rid of all of your water in concrete um, and making it really, really dry, for example, so then, then you can put down your flooring or any sort of vertical veneers and things like that is to actually keep it hydrated longer. Again, don't let it escape. Um, and this, this isn't a big secret if you look at uh, ACI recommendations, if you look at uh, International Concrete Repair Institute, uh, American Society for Civil Engineers, everybody will tell you, you know, wet curing if you're trying to create durable concrete, that's the way to go. Commercially, in the past, what has been uh, hard to, to do with wet curing is uh, time sensitivities. You've got clients, you know, that they want to open up an, a new store or library uh, sooner than the concrete would like it to. So what's nice about uh, some of these new technologies is you can still have wet curing which we know is the right way to do it, but in um, not only a, a similar construction schedule, but uh, it's actually faster, which is fantastic for the overall carbon footprint uh, uh, of, a, of a project, not having to have you know, trucks and honey buckets and stacked lights and generators on for as many weeks. Um, and at the same time, you've got those cost implications, right? If, if I can take a few weeks off of a schedule and I'm actually producing something better, more sustainable, it also costs less. So it's, uh, it, there've been a lot of uh, multifaceted catalysts that have really been helping this along, which is super exciting. Um, just a couple of quick case studies and then uh, Keith, I'm gonna start handing it over to you uh, for more of the vertical applications. Um, in Indianapolis, uh, the, uh, this, there's about 130,000 square feet 
um, all moisture mitigating uh, products as well as the labor for construction of this facility were eliminated. Um, you, you can't eliminate all moisture mitigation all of the time, but simply by allowing the concrete to fully cure, fully hydrate. You had guys seven days uh, after placement laying down tile. Um, there was some polishing, uh, carpet, carpet tile squares, you name it. Um, uh, it just absolutely expedited the process. Uh, total savings were somewhere around $400,000 US um, and just about eight weeks off of the schedule that they were open, uh, being able to open and then start taking care of, uh, of, of patients. So uh, it's not only more sustainable, it costs less to do, and they were able to get up and running and the facility could you know, uh, fulfill its purpose. Um, just some of the interiors there. Um, similar thing for a large, large parking deck. Um, uh, this was done uh, without any blankets, January, February, by being able to use uh, admixtures um, and the finishing aids that uh, Keith had mentioned to contain that water. Um, and if I'm a contractor, that sounds good because I don't have to be on the slab at 3 a.m. in the morning with a water hose freezing. Um, that sounds, that's, that's worth it just by itself. Um, and this was uh, an existing slab using a reverse process uh, to, uh, in, a, in a wet processing, wet refinement to grind back open that slab, turn the crown into a slurry, but then start that rehydration cycle. And so instead of using lots of uh, latex and acrylics and sort of epoxy grout coatings, you are creating more calcium silicate hydrate and blending the matrix back into itself uh, before densifying and then refining it so that you get uh, uh, a really durable, long-lasting floor. Um, and then uh, this has been, uh, and this is a little bit older information, a lot has gone on at uh, FCA since the original presentation, but um, from a cost perspective, uh, Fiat Chrysler Automotive had been thinking, you know, we, we've got 200 million square feet of, of real estate and we're constantly scraping up epoxy and sending it to wherever, shutting down production and then having to reinstall these epoxy floors all the time. Um, and so we worked with them for a couple of years on, on really trying to dial in using uh, existing slabs to be able to repel uh, transmission fluid, oil, water, things like that, and have it, to be, have it be very easy to maintain. So A, they can uh, keep their production going nonstop be, uh, because that's, that's where they would like to be uh, and competitively need to be, but the environmental implications to not constantly scraping off all this goop um, and sending it to you know to the bin to to be incinerated or even recycling, which certainly creates uh, you know a drain on the grid, uh, has been truly phenomenal. And I wish, gosh, I could do a whole presentation just uh, on what's been going on there, but I won't. <laughs> and uh, and I'm going to switch it over here now, kind of leaving. Uh, the uh, hydration and admixtures and stuff. And uh, Keith's gonna focus in on a lot of uh, the specific language. And Keith, you let me know when you want forwards, backwards, and, and, and whatnot. For sure. So, um, and all of this, by the way, can be written in a specification quite easily. Um, what it does take, though, is a different approach to specifications writing. One that actually addresses coordination, one that addresses talking to the individual uh, finishers, to perhaps change the way things have always been done. Um, focus on skilled workers. Uh, any contractor can go out and get tools and, and bring them to site. Uh, I mean, I was, I was uh, uh, floating concrete when I was 17 for a summer job and, and 
you know, uh, it doesn't take a lot of skill, but to do, to do it correctly means not doing it the same way, not bringing cream to the surface, not, as, as Chris said, not putting water on the surface so that you start getting separation between the paste and, and the aggregates. Um, vertical concrete, uh, again, very, very much the same way. We have to deal with um, the people, the people involved. Um, and uh, yeah, Chris, if you want to hit the button, just moving forwards. So yeah, here's, here's two projects that, we, that I've completed recently uh, using architectural concrete. St. Joseph's Seminary, uh, that entire chapel is, is titanium white concrete. It was placed in a single pour in one day uh, using four, four pumper trucks. It was all self-leveling, self-consolidating concrete using vertical forms that had uh, uh, like a fabric in 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 the in the facers to release any air bubbles and things that that uh, would work uh, we actually placed that concrete in march and i, I was i was showing daniel the uh, my the view out my window uh today it's it's uh it's zero degrees fahrenheit and uh, there's about four inches of snow on the ground already and that's pretty much what you know multiply the, the the snow depth by about a factor of 10 that's that's what march is like in edmonton alberta um, the other uh, project is the Aga Khan Garden, which is uh, west of our city here. Uh, again, all architectural concrete uh, with stone inlays. Um, and we achieved that through the specification um, by working with the people that um, uh, make the cement. So we talked to, to Lafarge, who is a cement uh, and concrete supplier. We actually got them to clean out their silos we uh, segregated all the aggregates. All the aggregates were the same quality, same type for the entire pour. Uh, we did constant checking of the, of, of, of the, of the mixes as, as at, the, uh, at the ready mix plant, making sure that everything was in place um, and, and that the, there was no variation in the mix. Uh, the trucks are coming to site constantly. We, as I said, we had four, four concrete pumps um, the pumps, uh, we actually had two spares because the pumps were running at such a slow rate. Yeah, and you can see the pumps on, the, uh, on that picture there. They were running at such a slow rate that the engines would actually overheat the motors pumping it. So as soon as one of the engines started to overheat, we would pull that pump out and put another pump in. Um, and you can see, uh, and, and as Chris said, this is March. Uh, we're, we're still dealing with minus temperatures and there was enough heat of hydration within this mass of concrete because that concrete was almost two feet thick that uh, we just covered the, the formwork with, uh, with insulating blankets. And we kept the forms on for two full weeks. Really scary not knowing how your concrete's gonna turn out and everybody's worried about whether or not we got enough uh, uh, form pressure release to actually pop the forms off once we get done. On the upper left there, you can see one of our samples. Um, it, was, it was a part of the uh, landscaping walls. We actually tested all this well before we actually uh, placed the, the final concrete um, to make sure that what, we were, what was theoretically possible was actually possible. Uh, we also poured a couple of elevator shafts and other parts of the, of the site to make sure that you know, the, the, the process was actually re repeatable. Um, you can see one guy uh, in, in, in amongst that forest of, of um, backstays. Uh, he's basically going around, walking around with a, with a hand grinder, hand sander, with no sandpaper on it, but just enough vibration, just to every once in a while to like, pop on the, the face of the form to release the bubbles out of the self-consolidating, self self-leveling uh, concrete. Um, and you can see the full extent of the formwork. We also worked with the formwork people, all this a year in advance of actually placing the concrete um, so that there's no mystery about when concrete shows up on site as to what's gonna come out of the forms, what we need to do to control the concrete. Um, so we plan for every possible what if scenario, except for the guy that after we pull off the forms, as is <laughs> typical when you, when you pull off concrete forms, uh, Joe with a, with a, with a mortar board goes out with his, um, trowel and starts to fill in all the bug holes. Well, this is, this is absolute white, sheer white concrete. <laughs> and he was using gray concrete paste. <laughs> and fortunately the architect walked in and just said, what are you doing? <laughs> Please stop. 
Um, so everything right down to, you know, training and actually getting buy-in from the entire crew. And the, the crew was, was absolutely uh, uh, critical to having, having this, uh, the, this concrete turn out as it did. As you can see here, the niche in the wall, uh, you can see up in the, in the, in the corner, the, the lower corner there, uh, those were the stained glass windows. This was massive concrete. Um, and yeah, it came out white. White, white as the driven snow, as they say. Uh, this was, as I say, it was a seminary. Um, so uh, the uh, uh, stations of the cross were set up. Um, the stained glass windows above and behind, you know, uh, cast in this amazing uh, uh, quality to the architecture. Um, yeah, one more okay. button there, Chris. Sir, go ahead. Sure, yeah, I was gonna say one thing that what you basically described which um, I think people don't realize is that with concrete, it's different from uh, you order something and the color and the texture, it's, it, it all happens, the product happens someplace offsite and is delivered. The project site is the factory. Um, and so what you know, Keith is describing is that process of, okay, before we turn on production, we gotta test it, mock-ups. Um, what happens if something goes wrong? Why might it go wrong? And what is the solution for that? Um, and it's just incredibly important to think of very, uh, it's a facility, you're building it, but it's kind of also a factory uh, and to keep that kind of quality control mentality. Um, and then I wanted to ask you a question. Um, you tell a good story, Keith, with uh, uh, talking with the, the church itself about how long they wanted it to last. And um, that is, yeah, tickled that. That's that. perfect. <laughs> the bishop, the bishop, you know, again, this was a, a lead building and uh, it was, uh, it, it, it was, hmm. and we were in Canada, we had a special credit at the time on building durability. Uh, this is the national standard CSA S478 that deals with building durability. So the typical question is, how long do you want your building to last? It's kind of a silly question as such because the, the bishop was looking and saying, well, well, how long is a long time? I said, well, you know, uh, typical school, we will build for 50 to 99 year kind of service life. Uh, you know, a hospital or a, you know, a church in this instance uh, would be, you know, 99 plus. And, it was one of those instances where, where the bishop, he put his arm around my shoulder and said, my son, I don't think you've noticed. He says, the church has been around for a few thousand years. We plan on being around a lot longer. <laughs> Basically, this, this whole building was designed to a 500-year uh, service life, put, putting that into perspective. Um, other real cool things here too. So Chris, yeah, uh, press away because uh, they've got some, I know we're, we're, we've got a time thing here too. So this is uh, in the background there, you can see some more of that amazing white concrete and off to the right hand side uh, is some of the form work we've done over at the University of Alberta. So we were working on the engineering building and they wanted to incorporate some of their uh, Jedi math that engineers do so well. Um, and a lot of texture in those forms. I, again, but, but that goes back to treating the spec as a design assist tool versus, you know, a, a listing of, well, here's my materials, here's my formwork, uh, contractor, you solve the problems. Very much hands-on hands interaction with the contractor through all of these processes. Each of these projects, uh, the, the seminary was probably a, a three-year cycle from planning to actually installation on site. The university building, uh, if you want to advance it there, Chris. Um, some really cool stuff, uh, even on the interiors, you can see how much um, relief we have on the formwork. There's other formworks where we've actually uh, put uh, leaves, we've actually glued, hot glued, melt glued uh, uh, tree leaves to the inside of the form facers uh, to, to recreate, if you like, the, 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 the unfortunate incidences when you're putting up uh, concrete formwork and things get hung up on reinforcing steel and things like that. We actually wanted to recreate that and actually create forms of nature in the face of the concrete. Um, all of these concretes, by the way, um, were, were, were done with self-leveling, self-consolidating concrete um, with, uh, with forms left on for more than the typical three-day cycle. 
you have to work with your owners on that to have them understand that buildings aren't just thrown up. Um, advance it one more there, Chris. So that's the outside of that uh, engineering uh, research uh, facility. Um, so very beautiful things. That building has now been in place for over 20 years. And the concrete looks as good today as it did then. Um, uh, we, we did use anti-graffiti uh, coatings, uh, siloxane type coatings, um, because unfortunately there are the people in the world and short of putting up laser guided water cannons, there's, there's very few things you can do to uh, prevent people from tagging your buildings. Um, and this building has been tagged and we've been able to clean off the, the worst of the tags with no ill effects to the concrete. Um, these days, I almost want to say that you want to get that on uh, as soon as you remove the forms. We've had people now where the, the formwork has been off for two days and we've had our buildings tagged and it's almost impossible to get that spray paint out of the concrete at that point. So, it Sounds um, like you're suppressing free expression, Keith. <laughs> heaven forbid. <laughs> what about the artistic expression of the concrete? Yeah, so this is the Aga Khan garden. Here we use the a combination of cast in place concrete and ultra high performance concrete. So the Aga Khan uh, uh, is, is, uh, is, is Miley uh, form of Islam and uh, pattern and, and um, asymmetry is critical to, uh, to if anybody's ever been to Alhambra in, in Spain, um, you'll, 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 you'll know what I mean when you see the filigree on all of the, uh, the concrete. Here we actually made several um, samples with an assigned crew. And again, another lesson learned is the crew that you've actually worked with on your mock-ups should be the crew that puts the concrete on on site. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> Uh, our, our, unfortunately, our crew uh, that we trained with uh, was moved off and went off to another project. So there were a few things, again, lessons learned. Um, you can see on the lower, the lower left slide there, we have these very nice form tie holes. Um, in the middle uh, slide, you can start seeing some gray fuzziness around. It. Yeah, so this is a perfect example. Um, so we had a form liner. You can see some of the, uh, the form lines and things like that. We, 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 we like those, and that was actually a part of the, the, the Ismaili aesthetic. Uh, they didn't want it perfect because perfect is according to, to uh, only, only God could be perfect in that sense. Um, so they said, no, a little bit of imperfection is nice, but it's nice to actually try to get perfection, so strive for it. Um, so it, it, what it meant was wherever there was a form tie hole, we actually sealed the, the cup, if you like, into the, into the face of the form so that none of the, the, the bleed water and paste ran out. And we got some pictures showing how that actually uh, would, would look. So tag ahead. And yeah, that's again, that's the distant shot that's uh, from using a drone. So here, yeah, you can see where we had some, oh, unfortunate instant with the skid steer. Um, yeah, you can see where the bleed water came out of the, the edge because the con concrete form workers didn't understand why we wanted to put silicone sealant between all of their uh, form joints. Uh, trust me, a bead of silicone stops all the, the, the bleed water from leaking out and all the cement paste washing out with it. Um, again, you know, something we actually now write into the specification. It's not an instruction on how to build, but it is put down as an agenda item uh, to speak with our, our formwork people so they actually understand what is necessary. Um, the other picture there too, you can see where they did not, uh, they over, um, they over uh, applied uh, form release oils and of course caused uh, blemishes in our concrete. Um, can move forwards again, Chris. Yeah, the unfortunate incident with the uh, rubber tire, tired vehicles. Um, and, and quite frankly, people not really caring at this point because I said we, we lost our original crew. They didn't understand that, you know, finishing the top of the concrete was equally as important as finishing the face of the concrete. So some lessons learned there and move forwards. Um, here you can see where we, our, our architectural concrete meets standard foundation concrete. Um, they actually did a really good job uh, uh, for all the concrete. Uh, given given the installation conditions and again this concrete was placed through the winter here and it, through the winter means concrete placed uh between minus 20 and minus 30 degrees 
Celsius, so definitely um, on the on the chilly side. Um, and we would blow temporary heat off and underneath, and again, keeping the formwork on place to maintain that uh, relative humidity of the concrete, which allowed the concrete to uh, react fully with uh, with any, any any mixed water that we had uh, to fully hydrate. Um, one more move. Oh, I see. I did it backwards. Oh yeah, that's okay. Yeah, so there you can see where we actually, uh, this is surface concrete. Oh yeah, this is our ultra high, uh, that's our surface concrete. And because this was a botanic garden, uh, leaves falling in our concrete was, was inevitable because we were surrounded by trees and we were doing the concrete in the fall. Um, we actually then took those leaves and actually created latex molds out of them and just randomly placed them in the surface of the concrete, uh, creating our own fossils. Yeah, forwards one more time. That's our ultra high performance concrete. This is uh, ductile concrete. Um, and that uh, concrete panel is only an inch and a half thick. Um, it, the, the compressor strength of that concrete is probably uh, 7,500 to 8,000 PSI. So it's uh, um, 80 megapascals, I think is, uh, it's, it's like steel. It is absolutely, Phenomenal what you can do with concrete. Um, I mean, I'm working with the concrete supplier again with Lafarge to to create the molds and the forms that, that actually created those and we could get repeatability out of them. Forwards one more time, Chris. Uh, yes, uh, examples of some really bad concrete because whenever you have good concrete, you have to have the countervailing bad concrete. Um, and, and we encounter bad concrete all the time, despite our best efforts to work with the concrete uh, suppliers, uh, push it forwards. Um, so here you can see where we've removed the formwork. This was supposed to be finished, beautiful concrete. This is what happens when you don't get good control at the, uh, at the mix plant, um, where they're incorporating fly ash into, into the vertical concrete, so those dark bands and you can see the layering and the different types of concrete. Uh, uh, we did not engage with the concrete people at that time, the people placing the concrete to properly vibrate the form. So this is one of the things uh, that we carried forwards on our lessons learned for better concrete. Um, this, is, uh, this is a school in South Edmonton, um, moving forwards. Again, bad concrete honeycombing. Uh, you can see uh, the, the poor, poor lines on the, on the left. And you can see where you have desegregation on, on the right hand side. Um, really, this is, there's no excuse for this. Uh, I mean, I've poured uh, co concrete in parkades that people think is architectural concrete. This is just an example of, you know, if, if you don't get people that care about the work that they're doing, you're gonna get very bad concrete. I know uh, um, Tadeo Ando, who's world famous for concrete. I got to meet him when I was working in Japan many years ago. He came to North America and started placing concrete. And it was just the, 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 the I'll say the lack of respect for the materials and the workmanship that he encountered was so unusual to him. Um, and he was a boxer. And I think he ended up uh, actually punching one of, the, uh, one of the concrete placement workers for not, for, for basically disrespecting the process. So. Um, I, I don't think I could get away with that. I, I'm not. I'm, <laughs> anyway, uh, let's move forwards one more before that story gets out of hand. Construction administration. <laughs> Construction administration. That's why we write big, thick uh, specification books so we can we can throw them at the contractor. Um, this is a stair, uh, and and for me it's a, a rather unfortunate because it was it, it was it also was covered over with some sheet metal panels um, uh, to accentuate the fluidity of the design. Um, but it took us three months to build the formwork for this. That's a single pour of concrete. And we, uh, we clad the top of the face of the concrete with, with marble and uh, the outside uh, then um, balustrades and such were, were aluminum uh, panels that had shapes and things to go along with it. Um, uh, unfortunately, nobody gets to see the artistry of the concrete, um, but I can tell you this is a very solid concrete stair. Um, I, I, I would say it's, it's, the, it's one of those pieces of concrete that I'm the most proud of, um, given that nobody can see it. So um, let's push it forwards, because I think uh, we were late starting, and yeah, that's, that's all you see of it now is, is the underside, and, and you don't really appreciate the structural ability of that concrete and, and, 
and what a monumental. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we've got about we, we've got about eight minutes, so we're doing okay. Good. Okay, for sure. So there's some bad concrete for you from the underside. We uh, uh, on the same project where you see the curvy stairs, where we spend a lot of time talking to concrete people. We also had people not really caring about placing floors, and when we removed all the all the the formwork, we looked up and that's what we saw: desegregated concrete. Um, so even where you have a project where you spend time working with people. And again, uh, that's what happens when you freeze concrete. You don't want your concrete to freeze. Uh, the water turns to ice and the concrete, uh, the cement never actually reacts. And when you take the formwork off, it all falls out. So horror stories. Um, uh, yeah, uh, different placement technologies for flat concrete. This was great. We use actually this is a, a, a concrete place method we actually use on, on on bridges and and roadways. It's the best way to place ultra 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 flat concrete. If you want to get FF one hundred and better, this is the way you do it. Yeah. Um, so let's see. We've got what well, maybe now like six minutes. Do we want to open it up to questions? Questions. I, yeah. Yeah. That's. Let's start doing questions um, before opening up uh, any other cans of worms. I, I think this is that'd be perfect. I thought I heard someone ask something, but it was very, very low. No, I don't have anyone. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Hang on. I, I will make a general comment uh, while we're waking, while while we're waiting. Uh, uh, even if uh, your three D equipment, your laser screens, things like that, aren't available, uh, how important it is for controlling that hydration process. You'll naturally end up right if water isn't looking for the weakest part of the concrete. To escape out of, you get less less undulation, so a little bit flatter floors, less cracking. Um, right, it's you know if uh, something about doing it right the first time or whatever. There's there's a lot of different ways, but uh, yeah, definitely if you want super flat for uh, uh, automated warehouses, things like that. All right, now Daniel, this is flashing at me. Does that mean that there's a question? Yeah, there is a question. question. Yeah, yeah, can you talk? Uh, it says, can you talk more about the materials that keep water in the concrete? Yeah, this is these uh, reactive um, silicas. Uh, they they actually uh, go on while the concrete is uh, in this picture. As you see it, when the concrete is still. Uh, in, in this uh, plastic state and then you you apply these silica uh, materials to the concrete and the, it, it actually holds the water in the concrete it actually seals off all of the um, uh, uh, ion channels that the water usually bleeds to the surface on and that's one of the things that's really special about uh, these um, surface finishing aids is by keeping the water in the concrete this is the first thing that changes. And that's also true, by the way, of fly ash. Fly ash keep, tends to keep the water in the concrete. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people that put the finishing machines on the concrete tend to go on too late. And all of a sudden, the concrete is hard and mostly set before they can start distributing the, um, uh, the, the aggregates with the, with the trowels. Um, but yes, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not really magic. It's just cool schmoo, as I call it, you know. Um, it's, and it's funny you bring up the fly ash on a lot of the uh, admixture varieties um, for controlling that placement water. You'll sometimes hear it referred to as liquid fly ash. Yeah. Uh, a lot of those same because of the performance properties. Yeah. Yeah. And we mix in uh, this uh, Lafarge is, is very big in um, silica additives to concrete as well as how you get ductile concrete. So in, in essence, that's what you're doing with applying uh, uh, these uh, reactive silicas to the surface while the concrete is wet um, because it, it absolutely closes off the surface for water coming up, which actually makes the concrete a better vapor barrier. It, it makes the concrete higher performing, more resistant to staining, more resistant to wear, 
um, acid attack. Uh, it, it basically, it incorporates, if you like, glass into the surface of the concrete. Yep. And what used to be the neat thing, uh, you know, early at the top of the presentation, we talked about the advancements uh, in technology when uh, these sorts of products start, first started appearing on the scene, you know, uh, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, um, getting adopted commercially, maybe five or six, you know, they've moved from uh, kind of like, you know, micro to all the way to you get these nano silica particles. particles. Yeah. Which, yeah. So what, and one of the things, is, yeah, and that's, and everybody's again, calling all this magic whiffle dust, you know, all sorts of different names. And again, introducing a, a lack of clarity into the specification, how we call out the products. Um, and that's one of the things, uh, um, not so much self-promotion on the part of Chris, myself and the others, but um, we created a glossary uh, using many, many different people, very knowledgeable people in the concrete uh, community to start standardizing those terms. What is a sealer? What is, what is, a, what is a surface finish? What is nanoparticles versus macroparticles? Um, just had a question there, yeah. Yeah, one last question and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Uh, I think th this will probably be a short answer, yes or no. Can Roman concrete be replicated today? Yes. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, <laughs> and you don't yeah, have to I, it's Oga. Oh, wait, did I was supposed to say how? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's the alumina in, in uh, some of the uh, puzzle lands that actually create that special property of Roman concrete. Um, Ray Taylor has actually done a lot of research on that. And, and so, yes, and then what that does is, as Chris said at the beginning, was it, is, it creates concrete that is able to actually repair itself. It closes off ion channels so that when you're building bridges and infrastructure, that when you put salt down on the roads, that, that salt isn't getting to the reinforcing steel and blowing the bridge apart when the, when the steel rusts to seven times its original volume within the concrete. So, yeah, Roman concrete... I think, again, from a sustainability point of view, you're going to see a lot more of that coming uh, into the normal vocabulary. Yeah. All right. Once again, uh, Chris and Keith, we really appreciate the time you put into this. And uh, uh, also, everyone, we appreciate your patience with getting this kicked off today. Uh, technology, don't we just love it? Um, <laughs> but thanks again. Uh, your insight on this topic, it's amazing. Uh, you're, you're right, it can keep going on and on. Uh, but for those of you who uh, participated, if you want your AI credit or CEU, uh, shortly when we end this, you should get a survey. If you don't, it'll definitely uh, come in an email again tomorrow. And if you don't even see that, let me know and I can manually log it in. With that, uh, appreciate your time and everyone, make sure you have a good day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Okay, I stopped that share, so I believe it's just us. <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. Oh, well, hello, everybody, still.